everyone. Welcome to the third annual JQD Hanukkah Hotties. My name is Carmel Tanaka. My pronouns are she and her. I'm the founder and executive director of JQD Vancouver, a volunteer-run Jewish, queer, and trans nonprofit dedicated to queering Jewish space and Jewifying queer space in Vancouver, BC on the ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. For Hanukkah this year, we are being generously supported by Creating Accessible Neighborhoods, an organization that advocates for and educates about disabled people with intersecting identities. You can learn more about this fantastic organization doing amazing work at canbc.org. Our community partner this year is LGBTQ at the J, the heart of Toronto's LGBTQ plus Jewish community, providing queer Jews opportunities to gather, celebrate, and thrive. For each candle of the holiday, we have a Hanukkah Hari joining us to light their Hanukkah, or perhaps share another tradition and chit chat about the wonderful things they do in life for the duration of the candles burning. For our fourth candle of Hanukkah Hotties, we are joined by Nathan Negan Noden Adler, pronouns he, they, a two-spirit Jewish horror author and filmmaker. He is author of Wrist and Ghost Lake and co-editor of Bawajigan, Stories of Power. He has an MFA in creative writing from UBC, is recipient of an Indigenous Voices Award and a Natitian Reveal Award. He is Jewish, Anishinaabe, Two-Spirit, and member of the Lac de Mille Lac First Nation. Nathan is also a documentary filmmaker living in Vancouver, though currently visiting his family in Toronto. You may have seen their sexy Highland stream featured at both Vancouver Queer Film Festival and Vancouver International Film Festival this year. Tuning in from Toronto, let's welcome Nathan Adler. Hi! Unmute. Hi, everybody. Hi, Carmel. Nice Hi, Nathan. You. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Doing all right. Visiting uh, Toronto at the moment. Uh, still on Vancouver time, though, so that makes it a little bit nicer. Thank you for staying up late in order to make this work for our time zone differences. <laughs> yeah. uh, why don't we start with lighting the candles? All right. Sure. Yeah. Movie sure. magic. <laughs> that was nice very slick okay oh i love your hanukia tell us more about it um so yeah when i moved to vancouver i didn't have one um so i bought i went to a, a a little shop i found a little shop and they sold like um judaica and the lady sold me this little travel sized one so it actually folds up so it can fit into your suitcase and now and then I knew what we were doing this and I'm like oh I need a I need I need a, a menorah a Hanukkah and so I, I so I, I full actually traveled with it so I used it for its intended purpose <laughs> but I've just been using it in Vancouver for the past couple of years because it it's it's nice to have one and yeah super one. cute well shall we light sure it's also very colorful too it's it's got like some nice We've got some detailing in there <laughs> and it doesn't take up a lot of space either so it's oh, not like, it right. holds up it's okay. super cute <laughs> right. i like that you know you made sure that you had your travel documents and your you know collapsible travel menorah with you <laughs> 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 yes. all right let's light okay there we go Okay, ready when you are. Okay. Barakata Ajna Malakalam Ashir Kichano Bamani Bamit Vatav Vatsivanu Vatsivanu Lehad Lickner Shelhanu Ka Yeah. That's how I usually do it. I just kind of mumble along. But my, my Hebrew is really bad. I, I only went to a couple of years of Hebrew school. I didn't learn very much, so. 
Oh, you did fantastically. What, what is this one not working? No, you'd think that the candles in the Holy Land would be made better. <laughs> no shade. Um, where did I get these? There we go. Bathurst and Shepherd. Yeah, these ones I just got at the, the local super. Um, and, they, and I got it because I thought there would be actual rainbow colors. But uh -huh. of course, there's no purple. There's no, oh, there's no yeah. light green. There's no nothing. Yeah, I was kind of looking for rainbow. I didn't see rainbow, but these ones had different colors. So. Mine says, yeah, look, um, look mine says black coastal. luster. This is. Yeah. yeah, no purple. No. Mine says uh, kosher and made in China. Uh -oh. Hold on. I wonder if that's the case here. Let's see. But everything's in Hebrew. Hold on. Let's see. No, definitely kosher. Mm. No, I think it's made here. Yeah, I think it's made here. Fun. Well, <clears throat> it's Hanukkah. Yeah, and yeah. I am so honored that you are one of our Hanukkah hotties this year. Do you want to get this started by sharing how we met? Um, how did we? Oh, yeah, you met my brother first in, in Toronto. You went to his restaurant in Kensington Market, Powell Cafe, and then you met him, I think. And then you guys hit it off. We bonded about being uh, G Jewish mixed with something else. And then my bro I guess my he, he found out that you were in Vancouver. He's like, oh, go go hang out with my brother. <laughs> go go meet my Vancouver, my, my brother in Vancouver. So we did, and that's how we met. We went out for a uh, drink at um, Fountainhead on Davy, and yeah, that, and that's how we met. And so, I still can't said. believe how I'm meeting people these days, and this was so, so wonderful. And for those who don't know, uh, Davy Street is the neighborhood in Vancouver in the West End. Um, and it just felt super normal to hang out with you as if we'd known each other forever. And then remember while we were having our drink, some random person from the Nicola Valley, Indigenous as well, just pops by and just likes to sit with us. Oh, oh that was because um, um, we were, I think we had the keys for our friend's place who who we were house sitting their okay. plants. And then her friend, who the, the Indigenous woman, she stopped by and she, she, she was picking up the keys because she was visiting and was going to stay at our friend, our, yeah, my boyfriend's friend's house. Or yeah, so it was like a random kind of like thing. I thought yeah. that was really fun. It just seemed like such a small world and it was just nice because Vancouver seems kind of big these days. Uh, lots of people traveling through, very international and it felt like, yeah, people are friendly, decided to sit down and join. Yeah. So I am a total fan. Um, and everyone says that, uh, a lot of the work that you do is really amazing from your films to your books. And I would love for you to share a little bit more about, you know, your creative work and how you like came to do that. Like, did you know from a young age, when I grow up, I want to be a writer and a filmmaker, or how did you come into this? Um, I, I guess I just like reading books when I was little, even I, I used to like reading books. So I, it, when I was pretty young, I, I was like, I want to do this. I want to write a cool story. Like I wanted to write like the stories I like to read. So when I was young, I, I kind of wanted to be a writer. Uh, and that was pretty young. So, uh, so that I guess I had that, like that idea in my head since I liked reading so much. And then, and then filmmaking, um, I took uh, film classes in high school, so I learned how to edit video on like VHS, like uh, recording from one big tape deck onto another tape deck, and then you'd mark in and mark out each each clip, and then you'd have to assemble. It was really kind of a painstaking <laughs> editing process, but that's how I learned how to edit, very analog. And then from there, I, I just like, I had this kind of like, uh, the whole production process and then the editing process we kind of went through in high school so then and then when I went to art school I was like 
always went for painting and drawing, but then I'm like, I already know how to paint and draw. So, so like, so I'm like, this feels like I, I could just do, continue doing it on my own. I don't need someone to teach me that. I'm like, I need to learn something that I don't already know how to do. So, mm -hmm. um, so I switched to integrated media, which was like mostly film and post-production stuff. And then, so then I was like learning all the really editing uh, uh, skills and uh, filming skills. So, so, and then, so that's where I kind of learned my filmmaking skills. Uh, and then I just, I've continued since then. And then also I was really involved in the mm. uh, imaginatives kind of like, I, I love going to that festival every year I would attend. And I, I had this goal, I, I want to get a film in imaginative. So I was like, that. I, I tried for like, it, it took me years to get a film in. I guess like I, I applied and then finally I got I had a film in. And I, now I've had like uh, a few like many films they've screened of mine there so and i and i i attend every year um and support the festival and all the other filmmakers and it's a real community kind of event so i and so i really love um that and i think that was a big whole kind of like thing that encouraged me to make film and make work is that i, I just wanted to get a past a badge that said filmmaker on it so i could go see all the films and go to the parties and like because i i just like enjoyed the community so much uh that aspect of it um so um yeah so that what encouraged me to tell stories in in that format and then writing I've always since I was a kid right I wanted to be a writer so um and I figure um yeah I, I might get better if I just keep on practicing <laughs> at, the, at those things uh and they're and they feel very similar to me too right they're just different kind of ways of telling stories right so you can write a story you can paint a picture and that can have a narrative to it or you can do some art, little artsy weirdo film that yeah so that's how I what I love about you also is how much of a social butterfly you are and how many events you go to I remember there was a week that I happened to be in town because I also haven't been around for very much and you were also going to a lot of the same events that I was going to. Um, there was the Gorillas concert. Yeah, there was I, the sure. Evening in Damascus. Yeah, I went to that <laughs> with you, actually. You, you, well, yeah, you, you with you. And the leftovers, let me tell you, that was solid. They were so good. <laughs> they were so good, yeah. I was so like, good. You don't expect to have good that great food at some of those kinds of events. You're just like, oh, it'll be edible, right? But it was actually really delicious. So I'm glad. Shout out to Tayeb uh, Catering in Vancouver. Excellent, excellent food. Um, and then there was something else that we were supposed to get to, and I don't know if it actually panned out. But anyway, I just think it's really cool that you go and support. You support other artists and causes, which is really, really, really cool. Um, yeah, I'd love to learn more about, uh, your family background and how did your parents meet? Um, so my mom had, uh, been going to high school in, uh, Guelph. Um, she, well, she went to residential school in, in, in Kenora. And then when uh, she finished, uh, grade eight, she was going to hi uh, high school in, in Kenora for part of, most of one year and then they moved to my grandmother came and they brought her to Guelph so then uh, when she graduated high school she went to university in Guelph uh, and then my dad was going to university in at the same time so they met in a French class um, and I think I don't know if it was my mom or my dad um, uh, that who um missed a class and was like what did I miss kind of thing and then and then I think it was my dad asked my mom to the opera <laughs> or no it was the ballet ballet I know it was something like that but yeah it was the ballet and then that was their first day yeah so that's how they met and my dad um he um was born in Poland but then they they came after the war they came to uh Winnipeg first and then Toronto so and then I guess he went, and then he went to university in Guelph. So that's how they, their paths kind of crossed in, at the universities. 
So and someone had to skip class in order to meet the love of their life. <laughs> and to oh, miss the class. Um, miss the class to have an excuse to be like, what did I miss? Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent way instead of a pickup line. Um, I mean, there's a little bit of thought and backstory involved there. Um, and then with your family from Poland, I didn't know that, uh, Nathan. And so did your family go through the Holocaust? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, my my grandparents were uh, living in hiding as like Christians. They were pretending to be Gentiles during World War II so they wouldn't be killed. And then um, so they survived and, and my dad survived because he was like a little blonde haired, blue eyed Jewish boy living in Poland <laughs> during World War II. Not the safest place to be a Jew in World War II. Right. So um but they 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 survived, and um, many of our other rel well, we don't have very many relatives on that side because a lot of them did survive. Like, um, yeah, all my grandmother's siblings, or no, some of her siblings decided, but all of my grandfather's siblings, and he had like a huge family, and a lot of them, um, only one of his brothers survived, and he had like ten siblings, and only one of them survived, other than him, himself. So, yeah, so um wow i mean i i didn't know that so we have similar but different uh ptsd laden family histories on both sides of our family as yeah. you may already know i also have grandparents who are holocaust survivors also very few of their siblings made it i, mean, I think one other on either side or at least a cousin did mm -hmm. everyone else was killed uh and then the japanese canadian internment uh, on my paternal side, and and then you have the residential school on your mom's side. Yeah. Did yeah. also all of her siblings um, go to residential yeah. school? Yeah, my aunt, uh, my uncle, uh, my grandmother, my grandmother's uh, siblings as well, and cousins. So like those two generations, everyone kind of went. Pretty much all, everyone went, except for my grandmother's oldest sister. Didn't somehow it didn't get didn't get sent to residential school or get, didn't get up somehow escaped being in one of the schools, but, um, but everyone else pretty much. And then, uh, yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking about the people who are tuning in. Some people may be familiar with what residential schools are. Others may not be. Do you feel comfortable sharing just a brief explanation as to what that was uh well they were boarding schools so they would just uh it, it, that one time that was like mandatory for indigenous children to attend the schools, so they were forced to um go, go to these schools but then they weren't um allowed to speak their language or practice their culture or religions or spirituality or like basically they were um uh it was called uh cultural genocide basically they were trying to wipe out indigenous people basically so that was canadian uh, uh genocide basically uh so for for me i grew up hearing stories about like residential school and then i grew up hearing stories about the holocaust <laughs> so it was like we're like what do you mean the government's not going to come in and steal all your children what do you mean? Oh, your family were murdered but and taken away with the Gestapo and murdered <laughs> like and then i was growing up in like a very white kind of middle like white t town and just like that most people didn't have those kinds of family hist like that history in their family they're just like it wasn't something people knew about mm -hmm. or understood what mm -hmm. you know so it's kind of like yeah I remember pe pe people being like oh I'll, I, like I would be like I just casually mentioned residential school and so, like some of my friends be like what's residential school I'm like what do you mean you know what residential school is <laughs> you know when the government comes and takes your kids away I'm like they don't yeah so it's just um a reality that you grew up knowing about and it just like it becomes sort of like um sort of just you you, you just accept it as like it's a, it's a, it's the reality it's just what you know so it's um yeah. I really resonate with that. I I also grew up in Canada and most people or most of my peers, especially until we learned about it in high school, 
um, <clears throat> and a little bit in elementary school. I think grade seven is when we ran, read, no, grade six was when we read Anne Frank's diary. Um, but still, I, I, it was pretty much, you know, a little bit of a, of a mention, but really didn't do a deep dive until later on in high school. And of course, I was the token uh, kid who would explain to the class uh, what was the Japanese Canadian internment and what was the Holocaust. And I'm looking back now as an adult, and that's a lot of emotional labor to put onto a kid yeah, uh, who's also that. just trying to learn and, and knows so little about the history. Um, I was very lucky that my mom told me everything that happened to our Jewish side of the family, everything that she knew. But I didn't have the information from the Japanese side. No one talked about it, what happened. And I didn't learn until I was in my 30s what happened. Uh, Were you ever put in a position to have to explain history. about your family trauma? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think in high school, teachers would do that. They'd be like, oh, they, they, they did, maybe there was like a two-day unit on like, um, uh, indigenous history, and then maybe they'd be like, they, they, like they knew my mom was native, so they'd be like, "You there? <laughs> what do you think? Explain everything, because you're native." It's like, oh, okay, that's a lot of pressure to put on like one like shy like kid, and and when it's surrounded like by a class of other people that aren't of that background, so it's kind of yeah, it's it's it, I don't think teachers should do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. No, and I'm really hoping that things have changed a little bit of more awareness of <clears throat> putting um, the uh, responsibility on kids uh, in that manner. But yeah, interesting. So I think this is also probably why we get along so well. We're both like screwed up on both sides. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I know. Yeah. And, and I would love to know how your family histories, you're also your mixed identity plays into the work that you do, whether it's writing or filmmaking. Um, yeah, I think it does. Like, it, it's kind of hard to avoid sometimes, like, especially like, um, when you're just trying to process that history. So you're, you, it ends up in your artwork too. And then, but then you don't always want to be like sad about stuff. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> like oh let's be sad about the holocaust for and it's like oh let's be sad about the residential school system it's like yeah those things are horrible and they're but they're also realities that you just kind of uh i guess that's the way it is but then you don't always want to spend all your time being sad and about that you also want to like i i don't know find ways you want to celebrate you don't want to yeah, just be well, known yeah. about yeah like yeah we're we're more than just our traumas right so like we want to like move past them and like uh um like remember them for sure but then it still ends up in your work so um even when you're trying to like not be sad about things it's still the themes kind of of surviving or like uh, i don't know of like um all the, those themes still get worked in like you're like oh i don't, don't want to be sad about colonialism i'm gonna tell us to oh, already that's said in the pre-colonial past before colonialism ever happened it was it wasn't even a thing yet i can't so it can't be a story about colonization because it didn't happen yet and then still somehow all the themes of like get, still get worked in there it ends up being a story about colonialism anyway and you're like fuck <laughs> so. but isn't that the case i mean i think it's so deeply ingrained in our dna and the way that we operate in our like what is it um like our operating system i do think it's coded in for sure everything that i do all my projects whether it's jq or the Japanese oral history project or genocide prevention bc or even my walking tours the cross-cultural walking tours everything is based on um trying to repair the the wrong that's been done um, to not only my communities, but also other communities. Yeah, it, it always ends up in your art. Eh? Uh, yeah, always. So it's that my yeah. Um, 
doing a documentary too and it that's a about the well i'm doing a graphic novel it's about residential school and then i'm doing a documentary but that's about the holocaust so it's like yeah i'm doing <laughs> doing both things right now they're both like non-fiction like um family history projects basically so that's those are the two things i'm working on right now so like they're like they're not even like fictional kind of things where the themes just get woven in these are just like literally this is what i'm just telling the stories like here's some stories they're just non-fiction so i don't have to like kind of like circle around or anything it'll just be like the themes will be like right in your face. right in your face like <laughs> there's no there's no lens this is straight up fact yeah um i remember as a kid uh being told by my peers and also as an adult that it's time to let the past go, time to let it go. And I also was told very recently by someone here in Israel where I'm currently visiting, working on my my documentary about what it's like to be Jewish and Japanese, um, that I need to let go of the past traumas of my family. And I thought that was really interesting that I was hearing it from both non-Jewish people as well as Jewish people. But I'm struggling really hard with this concept. And I'm just wondering if you have this issue too, because at least on my side, you know, the Holocaust is a lot closer than, than, you know, for, for, for me, because my half aunt was killed in Auschwitz. So I mean, that's that's my mother's generation. That's not really far for me. Yeah, it's not that far either for me because it's like my dad could have been murdered. Like he was in a very high risk situation, right? He could have been one of those uh, family members that didn't make it. So for me, it doesn't seem that far in the past. Um, and I, I guess when you're thinking about... Um, telling stories in your art it's not about like um it, you can let go of the trauma but that but you can still tell the stories you don't have to be it's like i um you can say i'm not gonna be controlled by the trauma anymore but it's still like you can still remember the stories you can still tell the stories like they're still important that they get told right regardless of whether it's not like you're clutching onto your pain <laughs> holding on to it like 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 that so hmm. much as it's like oh there's still important stories that need to get told regardless of uh, uh of that so i think you can get let go of the your trauma but then still tell the stories because they're they're important and they need to get told so um so yeah um 100 yeah. and i also feel that by doing this work i am working through the trauma yeah it, it um, can help you process and come to terms mm -hmm. and understand where you come from and how yeah all that all those things and heal for sure um and so i'm curious how did your art eventually bring you into the world of indigenous horror as a genre uh probably just because i like reading horror and fantasy and urban fantasy and sci-fi and that genre of fiction I, I read lots of everything i like fictions like i'll read lots of everything but i also read lots of horror so like when it came to like writing fiction i was i wanted to write specifically urban fantasy and horror so like really kind of morbid kind of um uh gothic kind of stuff because I, I used to be a big goth too i was really into goth things and goth everything uh so goth like these too yeah so so like i like everything gothic and morbid so then i was like oh, i want to tell a, a horror story but then i also wanted to tell um so urban fantasy is basically um the conventions are that you take uh le like legends and folklore and then you but you set them in the modern day that's the standard convention of urban fantasy so i was working with those conventions so i was like okay well i'm not i don't just want to tell like a werewolf or vampire story because those are your that's that's european folklore right so i'm like okay well um um, I'm indigenous too, so I'm going to tell. I'm I'm going to do an indigenous urban fantasy story. So I'll use, so I'll take um 
some traditional monsters and I'll set set it in the current day and I'll 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 do an indigenous urban fantasy horror story. So that's kind of how I ended up there. Just that I wanted to tell because I, I wanted to tell a story that I like and I, the stories that I like were urban fantasy and horror, but then I couldn't do it this, the way that they other writers do because not those writers. So I needed to do it uh, differently, so, sort of. So using some of the conventions, but then, yeah, not all of them. So, so I mean, why don't you let us know how to get a hold of your books and, and your work? How, how can we How can we buy your stuff? Uh, you can always go to your local independent bookstore, ideally. Um, you can also go to uh, Kaganos Press uh, website and purchase directly from the publisher or XL Editions, one, one of my other publisher. You can purchase directly from them you can go, or you can order, go to the bookstore, order it uh, or order it online um, and all, all the standard ways you would normally buy books. They're, they're available. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, uh, Ghost Lake is um, my last book that came out. So, it's a collection of short stories. So, that 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 would be a good place to start if you are interested. Yeah. In reading, um, Have you taken your books down to Massey Books in Chinatown? Um, I. What do you mean taken? <laughs> Not not just taken, but have have you been in touch with them? Because I, if you haven't, your work should totally be in there. I think I I was signed up. I did I signed I went in just to sign some books when they had some copies in. I, I don't know if they still have any copies left, but um, and then I pop into the chapters too once or, once in a while. Find books there, just if the ones that if they have any on the shelf, I just like yeah, see, grab nice. a pen, stick it back on the shelf. So so switching gears a little bit. Um, to bring in our queer identity into the conversation. How does that also uh, get woven into your work, um, in your life? And how are you celebrating being all of all of your identities, Jewish, Anishinaabe, and queer? I try, I try. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's it's kind of like the the when you start writing um, and you can't, you can't really leave yourself out of it, kind of like it, it, you're the, the, the Jewishness gets into the work, the indigenous, indigeneity goes into the work and then your queerness goes into it too. So it, it's not like you can stop your, those things from being in the work, even if you wanted to, even if I was like, oh, I don't want to write a, a, a indigenous kind of story. I'm just going to do it like a, only a Jewish story. <laughs> it's probably, it's probably not going to work like that. But so like, if I said, oh, I don't want to write a gay story. I want to write like a non-gay story. <laughs> it's probably not going to work. It would probably end up being really gay. <laughs> even if I tried to not do that, you know, like, so I don't think it's really possible to like, entirely let, let, I guess I could try but um yeah but also why would I want to right <laughs> so um so the the so a lot mostly my my writing the stories are I, I, I like have writing queer characters in particular because um because I didn't see a lot of queer characters either in film or tv or in books like uh, at all like growing up I, I think um very few queer characters or or and when they were there they were not positive representations so they were all pretty negative and terrible like trauma Let's talk about trauma traumatizing right like zero positive yeah. like representations of queer identity that's pretty traumatizing so so when i write now i'm like i'm gonna write i want i need some positive <laughs> so i, I need to, i want i feel like moving forward i want more like positive queer representation and in storytelling um especially in like with the YA like I, I was in chapters the other day and I saw a whole table of YA queer fiction and I'm like what mm. <laughs> did not exist when I was younger so I'm happy that that's now a thing uh so yeah Queerness. for sure when I walk into the children's section um or youth uh fiction over at Massey Books it it's so different from when I was a kid, that there's, 
you know, examples of mixed families, mixed stories. Um, there's now Jewish and stories out there, um, which is really, really great. And speaking of Jewish and, have you met other Jewish and either Anishinaabe or other First Nations combinations? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, other J Jewish and uh, Anishinaabe or Jewish and Indigenous. Yeah, I've met a few other oh, people that are like, like that. Um, I don't know very many of them like very well, but uh, there was um, the Potemsky sisters are pretty well known um, for being the J Jewish and, and Indigenous. They're like um, in the film world. Um, I don't know if I met very many Jewish Ojibwe or Anishinaabe um, people, though. Mostly just my my relatives, right? Like my brothers and sisters. <laughs> so yeah, my brothers and sisters. Uh, yeah, so because I have two brothers and two sisters, and they're 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 yeah they're Jewish and Anishinaabe. So yeah. That's so interesting. And the reason why I'm asking is I'm asking this question also while working on my project. It turns out in North America, most uh, Jewish and Japanese people, um, aside from their siblings, haven't met another Japanese person until I come knocking on their door, mm. asking for an interview. Uh, but those who do uh, and have met someone before, they remember the first meeting like it was yesterday. They remember every detail because it's meeting a, someone, a, a mere image of you. Yeah. Life affirming in, in many ways. The, uh, the cultural similarities and experiences would probably be very uh, similar. You'd be like, oh my God, there's someone else like me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I know I haven't met a lot like like and usually when I met them it's been like in passing and then I yeah so I don't know very many people closely that other than my relatives so well know. they're out there and and I actually uh helped to start a little tiny Facebook group thread um it's not super super active but I I don't know how many there's maybe 20 in that group now at this point but I know that there's more. I thought that there weren't as many Japanese people in the world initially, and now there's hundreds. So they're, they're, they must be out there. And it's just, you know, a lack of being affiliated with either community as a result of the, the families mixing um, yeah. that, you know, prevents, prevents them from meeting others like them. Yeah. I know, I know there are other Jewish indigenous people around there's there's probably a lot more than you you'd even mm -hmm. know about right um unless people go around talking about it like we are <laughs> yeah yeah that's the other thing is not everyone shares their their jewish identity um if they're depending on you know if they're more white passing they might not even say that they're also japanese super interesting the things that i've been learning on this project yeah interesting well is there anything well i'm looking at your candles and you've got one that's about to go I, yeah they're, 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 this one's getting really low yeah that one's low so before we lose the light is there anything that you would like to share with us mm -hmm. perhaps a a greeting for hanukkah a wish for 2023 just that people have a better year ahead of them. Yeah, hopefully a better year ahead. Uh, um, and thanks for inviting me on this like little chat. It's been really lovely talking to you virtually on uh, on this on the the video call. Um, and yeah, um, with the light of the fire, really beautiful. The fe the holiday of lights. <laughs> certainly is a beautiful holiday and I'm really happy to share this with you so I'm going to conclude by thanking Nathan Adler or Hanukkah Hadi for joining JQD today as our fourth 
Hana Kahati. Uh, be sure to follow their work on all the socials and websites. We'll be providing all of that information uh, in our event description. And thank you to our sponsor organization, Creating Accessible Neighborhoods, and our community partner, LGBTQ at the J. Thank you all for tuning in to JQD Hanukkah Hotties. Happy Hanukkah and Chag Chanukah Sameah!